Hello and welcome to the Sysadmin Tutorials YouTube channel. Today we are going to be taking a look at the new VMware 6.5 ESXi server. First up we'll be running through a new installation and then we'll be spending some time in the new web user interface. Now if you have installed VMware ESXi server before, a lot of these steps will be quite familiar to you. However, if this is your first time, you're going to see how easy it is to get your first ESXi server up and running. On the welcome screen here, we're just going to click enter. And we'll press F11 to accept the end user license agreement. Now it's asking me where I'd like to install my ESXi server onto. As you can see, it's picked up an 80 gig local hard drive. And I'm going to be selecting this for my destination. I'll also select the US default keyboard layout. And I'm going to type in a root password and then just confirm the password once again. Now the wizard is ready to begin the installation. We're going to click F11 and let it begin. It only took a few minutes to finish the installation. Now we're going to reboot the server and continue with the configuration steps. Okay, our VMware ESXi server is booted up. I'm just going to extend this window a little bit. And we're going to jump straight into the configuration. Here we're going to press F2. And we'll type in our root password. This is going to take us to the system configuration. We'll head on down to the configure management network and we're going to give this server an IP address. I'm going to enter into the IPv4 configuration. And I'm going to select set static IPv4 address. So I'll press spacebar on here to move the little zero and select this option. Then I'll go down to the IP address and we'll type our IP address in. We'll also type in our subnet mask. And lastly our default gateway. And we'll press enter. If we go into the IPv6 configuration we have the option to disable IPv6. So I'll press spacebar on that to disable it. And it just lets you know that we'll need to restart the server to fully disable the IPv6. I'll press enter. If we move down to DNS configuration, I'm going to enter in my primary DNS server. We have the option to also specify a secondary DNS server. In hostname, we're going to type the fully qualified domain name. And once we're done here, we'll press enter. In custom DNS suffixes, I'll also enter here my domain. As you can see up the top, we have the option to also select a VLAN for our management network. To do that, just press enter and type in the VLAN number that you'd wish to use. From here, we'll press escape. We're going to press Y to apply the changes here. It's going to go ahead and reboot the host due to disabling IPv6. What I'll do is I'll just pause the video so you don't have to go through and watch the full reboot of the server. And then we'll be back once we're ready to log in again. Our server is now rebooted, so we're going to press F2 and we're going to log back in. We're just going to run through a few of the other options that we have here in the configuration. We have the ability to completely restart the management network. This is effectively restarting the complete network stack of the server. But you could use this option if you are experiencing some network issues on your ESXi server as a troubleshooting step. Another troubleshooting step that we can perform is on the test management network. If we go into this section, we have the option to ping up to three IP addresses and also do some DNS resolution. Moving on, if we enter into the network restore options, we can restore our networks back to factory default. This is extremely useful if you lose access to your ESXi server due to network misconfiguration. It will completely restore your network settings back to factory default, where you can go back in and re-enter your IP address, subnet mask and default gateway. The two options below that, the restore standard switch and restore VDS are greyed out as we're not connected to any vCenter server at this stage. Now I'm going to go back one menu. We can reconfigure our keyboard layout if we wish. Moving on to troubleshooting options. We can enable the ESXi shell. If we enable the ESXi shell by just pressing enter on it, we can then press Alt F1 and we move into the CLI prompt. To return back to the GUI, we press Alt F2. We can also enable SSH. And we have two options here to modify the ESXi shell timeouts and also the DCUI idle timeouts. 
Lastly on this page, we can restart the management agents. This comes in extremely handy, especially if you have your ESXi server connected to a vCenter server and you have some issues with the host D service. You may come into your ESXi console and select this option to restart the management agent. Again, as another troubleshooting step. Last few options here, we can view the system logs. We can view the syslog information, VM kernel, config management agent, virtual center agent, and VMware ESXi observation log. I'm just gonna show you the VM kernel log. We can browse through that and have a look what's happening on the system. To get out, we just press Q. Second last option here is some support information on the server. We can see the serial number, the license key, if there is one. At the moment, you can see I'm running an evaluation. This is all thumbprint. And if we press page down, we can see some information on the hardware of the server. The last option here is to completely reset the system configuration back to factory defaults and start from scratch. So I'm gonna escape out of here. This will log me out of the console and we're gonna move over to our web browser. In our web browser, we're gonna to browse to the IP address of our ESXi host. We're gonna accept the certificate here. For our username, we're gonna type in root and we'll enter in our password that we entered while we went through and did the setup. Now this logs us into the brand new web user interface for the ESXi server. VMware have made the web user interface extremely fast. It's actually very, very nice to use. And we're just gonna go through and take a look at a few features here. On the first page, we can see a general summary of our host with some hardware information and configuration system information on the right, along with the recent tasks that have been running at the bottom here. We have a few options up the top here where we can create new virtual machines. We can shut down the host, reboot the host, refresh the information on this page, and we can also click on actions. And we have a drop down menu here with a few other options that we can use to configure the system. If I move on to manage, Again, this is management for our host. We have some system configuration information here, power management policies, licensing information, including all the features that have been unlocked, the packages that are installed on the server, whether the services and whether the services are running or stopped. And we also have the security and users section here. Within this area, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new role. I'm gonna call the role VM, power on, power off. And I'm gonna scroll down and select a virtual machine select interact and select power on, power off. And I'm also gonna be selecting reset. I will click add. You can see our role was created right here. I'm now gonna to go to users. I'm gonna select create user. For the username, I'm gonna type David R. I'm gonna give this user a password and click add. My user has successfully been added just underneath the root user here. Let's go along and just create a virtual machine. So I've clicked on virtual machines here on the left and up the top here, I'm gonna select create register VM. We have three options. We can create a new virtual machine, we can deploy from OVF, or we can register an existing virtual machine. However, we'll be selecting create a new virtual machine and we'll select next. We'll give the virtual machine a name. For the guest OS family, we'll be selecting Windows. And for the guest OS version, we will be selecting Microsoft Windows Server 2012 64-bit. For the storage, we're gonna be selecting our local data store, which is data store one. As you can see here, we have 71 gig free. In this next window, we can customize the hardware. I'm gonna give my web server two vCPUs. We'll leave the memory and the hard disk at the default settings. We'll also leave the network adapter, CD and video settings as default. One addition you can see here under USB controller one, we have selected USB 2.0 as the default. You also have the option to select USB 3.0. Back up the top here, we'll select VM options. We'll go down to boot options and we're gonna select forced BIOS setup. So once the virtual machine runs for the first time, it's gonna go straight into the BIOS. We'll click next and we've got a summary of our virtual machine setup. Once we click finish, the virtual machine will be created. Now that a virtual machine is created, I'm gonna explain why I created that David R username along with the role of VM power on, power off. If I right click on this virtual machine and I go down to permissions, I can now add the user, David R, with the role VM power on, power off. And this user now has access to power on, power off and reset the web server 01 virtual machine. 
This is quite powerful for restricting access to certain users on an ESXi server without the use of any vCenter server. Now we're going to go ahead and click close. So now we're going to launch the console of the virtual machine. So I'm going to right click on the virtual machine, go down to console and select launch remote console. Once the console has been launched, we can simply select the VMRC menu, go to power and select power on. As we can see here, it's gone straight into the BIOS and we can go ahead into the boot menu and select CD-ROM first, followed by hard drive. Now to boot to the CD-ROM, we're going to click on the VMRC menu again, select the removable devices, CD-ROM DVD drive, and we're going to go into settings. We have two options of where we can get our ISO image file to install Windows on. We can either select the remote server, and if I have used ISO image selected, I can click on browse, and this basically browses the local data store of the server. So if you have the ISO image there, you can simply select it and it will mount that image for you. The other option is in location. If we drop that down and select local client, we can now click on browse. And this is going to bring you to the local drives of the current server you are on. From there, you can either browse the network or select local drives here on the side. Here's our Windows 2012 R2 ISO image. I'll select that and click open. Click OK. Back in the BIOS setup utility, we'll select exit saving changes. Select yes. And we can see Windows is beginning to load and install. I'm going to go ahead and minimize this console window for now. And we'll just move on to storage. Within storage, we can see our data stores. We only have one, which is the local drive at this stage. We can browse the data store from here by selecting data store browser. And we can upload, download files, delete, move, copy, create a directory and refresh. We can see our storage adapters here. Under this menu, we have the option to configure iSCSI as well. And lastly, in our devices, we can see our local disk and also our CD-ROM drive. Moving on to networking. Under virtual switches, we can see that we have a vSwitch 0. This is a standard vSwitch. And within that vSwitch, we have two network ports, VM network and management network. We can add port groups in this window, along with VLAN IDs, which virtual switch we want to connect the port group to, and what security settings we want on that port group. Under physical NICs, we can see that we have one network card, and it's called VM NIC 0 along with its MAC address and link speed. Moving on to VM kernel NICs, we can see we have VMK0 set up for our management network, along with the IP address that we set up during our initial configuration, which was 192.168.1.198. Next is the TCP IP stacks. I'm going to show you in edit settings. We have the host name of the ESXi server, along with the primary DNS server, the search domain vmlab.local, along with IPv4, gateway 192.168.1.1. Again, these are all the settings that we entered during the initial configuration. And where does this TCP IP stack tie into? If we go back to VM kernel NICs, we can see that the VM kernel NIC VMK0 uses the default TCP IP stack here, which then goes ahead and applies the DNS, the default gateway, and so on. If I edit this VMK.0, and expand IPv4 settings, we can see that we only have the IP address and the subnet mask here. The rest of the settings like DNS, default gateway and so on is retrieved from the TCP IP stack, which is selected right here. The last tab on the networking information is the firewall rules. On this page, we see a whole heap of firewall rules that come installed by default with ESXi. Editing one of the firewall rules we have the option to allow the connections from all IP addresses, or we have the option to allow connections from specific IPs or networks. If we head back up to monitor, which is under host here on the left side, we're now on the logs tab. And if we select one of the logs here, we can see all the information contained within that file. We also have the option to search within that log file on the right hand side here by typing in a search term. And lastly, if we head over to the performance tab, 
we can see the performance of the ESXi host itself. The performance counters that we can see are CPU, memory, network and disk. And it provides up to the last hour of information and graphs. Now that concludes this video on the new ESXi 6.5 from VMware. I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for watching and we'll see you in the next video.